And we're certainly glad that you're here this morning as we look at God's, uh, God's Word. Before I do start, though, I want to encourage you to come back tonight at 6 p.m. as we will be having more of a, of a prayer session rather than a, a study, per se. So please come back tonight as we're going to focus more on prayer to God. This morning's title is called Overcoming the Guilt. Do you still feel, to feel guilty for a past sin, one that you have already repented of? If God has forgiven us of that or those sins already, why do we still feel guilty about them? Studies show that feelings of guilt can result in anxiety, crying, insomnia, muscle tension, preoccupation with past mistakes, regret, a upset stomach, worry, and even social withdrawal. Some studies say that some 40 million adults in the United States suffer from anxiety disorders. And it is not uncommon for someone with an anxiety order to also suffer from depression. I'm wondering how many of us here in the auditorium are still feeling the effects of anxiety or depression due to past forgiven sins. David put it this way in Psalms 25 and verse 7, Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, according to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness. Then in verse 11, he says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And then in verses 17 and 18, he says, The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. David was quite aware of the sins that he had committed in his life and was begging God to be merciful to him. Well, another study revealed that about 50% of those who describe themselves as Christians believe that they'll go to heaven. 50%. Now, 50% of us believed that we were going to go to heaven. The other 50% doesn't believe that they'll be going to heaven. Something to think about. Our text this morning is found from the book of Micah, chapter 7 and verse 19, but I'd like to start reading in verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not regain his anger forever, or retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. Verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Well, as we begin our lesson this morning, I'd like to look at five different men from the Bible and some of the things that they encountered in their lives. The first one is, is Moses. Moses did a lot of great things, but Moses also was disobedient to God. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 through 12, God gave directions to, to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before your eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them to give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him, 
Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. A heavy cost for Moses and Aaron for disobeying God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, Peter writes, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Well, to Moses' defense, the Israelites were no doubt habitual complainers, always griping and never being satisfied. But that did not give Moses an excuse for not doing what he was told to do. Moses was God's representative to the people. For Moses to lose his cool and call the Israelites rebels, and then in anger fail to follow God's instructions, that was unacceptable. How many times if you or I said or did something that we later regretted. I, rem I imagine that Moses remembered what happened that day throughout the rest of his life. Again, Moses kills an Egyptian. In Exodus chapter, chapter, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, the Bible says, One day... When Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean as to kill me as, as you killed an Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. No doubt Moses' actions were heavy on his heart. In Matthew 5, verses uh, 21 and 22, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. A lot could be said about whether the Egyptian was out of line beating the Hebrew. However, that never justifies taking another person's life. Moses didn't easily forget what he did. Not only did two other Hebrew witnesses see what he did, the word got out to Pharaoh, resulting in Moses hiding into another place. Our second example we want to look at is, is Jacob. And we've been studying Jacob and some of the other people from uh, Genesis recently in our Sunday evening class. Jacob, one of the things that he did was he showed favoritism. In Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a, a robe of many colors but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his other brothers they hated him 
and could not speak peacefully to him. James, chapter 2 and verse 1, says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the, truth, the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And then in James chapter 2 and verse 9, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. If you thought showing family favoritism was bad enough, James tells us that doing the same with those coming into our assemblies is also sin or transgression. Just think of all the grief that Jacob brought on his life and the life of his 12 sons by not treating Jacob, or Joseph equally with his other brothers. Perhaps none of the evil, none of the acts of evil would have ever taken place. Jacob also deceives his brother Esau and lies to his father. In Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 34, the Bible says, Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Also in Genesis 27, verses 18 through 25, So he went into his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may, be, may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. And Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near so that I may feel you, my son to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it near to me, so that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Ephesians 5 and verse 6, Paul says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Although Rebekah, Isaac's wife, played a major part in Jacob's sins, Jacob had a lot of time to think about what he was doing. Yet he still carried out the plan. I suppose Jacob knew full well what he was doing, knowing that it was wrong. Not only to deceive his father, but to also do his brother wrong. As we know from Scripture, this sin haunted Jacob for many years. The third person we want to look at this morning is David. Well, we know there's a lot of things that David did. One of them was he committed adultery. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2-5, through 5, the Bible says, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent out and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Iliam, 
the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Not only did David look at Bathsheba with lust, he physically carried out that act of adultery. David also arranged for the murder of Uriah. In the same chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 14, the Bible says, In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the, way, by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were violent men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the, the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. 1 John 3 and verse 15, John says, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. David, in these two passages, allows one sin of seeing Bathsheba's bathing to eventually end up having sex with her, getting her pregnant, and ultimately arranging to have her husband, Uriah, put to death. Sometimes committing one sin can lead to committing multiple sins. Let's look at a couple from the New Testament. The first one we want to look at is Peter. Peter did a lot of good things, but he had some mistakes too. One is he denied the Lord. And we've been studying this some um, on Wednesday nights. In Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34, the Bible says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. Well, then in verses 54 through 62, the story goes on and says, Then they seized him and led him away, speaking to Jesus, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down be together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he was seeing him, as he, as he sat, sat down together, I was seeing him from a distance, when he had, okay, let me get back to verse 55 again. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Cedars, Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of, of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter 
And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord when he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Do you think that Peter's heart was beating pretty hard at this time? I would imagine it was. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 33, Jesus says, But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Was Peter any different than any of us here in the 21st century? How many times have we knowingly refused to mention or acknowledge Jesus or God when we're in a crowd of unbelievers? Are we sometimes afraid to tell others about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Peter also allowed pride to get into his way. In John 13, verses 4 through 9, Jesus speaking says, He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing to you, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, John writes, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of, of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God Bites forever. Probably most, if not all, sins are from these three categories the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Peter was guilty of, of letting the pride of life get into the way. Do we, you and I, sometimes allow our pride to get in the way? Our final example we want to look at is from the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we read about Christians that Paul persecuted. And Saul approved of his execution, talking about Stephen, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation for, over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. I can see why Paul called himself the chief of sinners, having put Christians to death and in prison. Paul also was a blasphemer. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, Paul, again, he writes about himself. He says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. In Mark chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Paul spoke quite boldly about his past, telling it like it was. He committed some of the most atrocious acts 
anyone could ever commit. Yet, because Paul changed and repented, he was forgiven. Well, that leaves us up to you and me. Where do we fit in all this? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes this. He says, For do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the kingdom of God, in the true name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. We, like some of the Corinthians, may have been guilty some of some of the same unrighteous sins that Paul mentions in this text. However, these Corinthians who repented were washed, sanctified, and justified. We too, if we have repented, have been washed, sanctified, and justified. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul reminds the Ephesians that they too were, were dead in their trespasses and sins, but they, the Ephesians, changed or repented of those sins, therefore being saved by grace, made alive together with Christ. In Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, and then also in verses 12 and 13, Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body and make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as sin to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Here, Paul reminds the Roman brethren that they are to not, not to continue in sin, but rather serve God. All three groups Paul addresses, the Corinthians, Ephesians, and the Romans, the ones who repented now are in a forgiven or saved state with God. If it was true with them then, why shouldn't it be true with us today? In summary, first just look back at our text. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Well, as a reminder, we looked at Moses, was disobedient to God, and he killed an Egyptian. Yet, in spite of his sins, Moses makes the great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 24 through 28, the Hebrew writer says, By faith, Moses, when he had, was grown up, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to that reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured 
as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the first brown born might not touch him. And we know Moses lived to 120 years old and he died where he could see the promised land at a distance. Well, Jacob, we know Jacob showed favoritism and was deceiving and lied to his father and, and his brother. Like Moses, Jacob also makes the great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 20 and 21 says, By faith, Isaac, Isaac uh, invoked future uh, blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph, bowing to worship over the head of his staff. Jacob lived to be 147 years old. David committed adultery and then arranged the murder. Like Moses and Jacob, David too makes the great chapter of faith. Hebrews 11, 32 to 34. And when, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. David died of natural causes at the age of 70 and was buried in Jerusalem. Peter, well, Peter denied the Lord and let pride get into his way amongst a num number of other things. But later, Peter preaches a sermon on Pentecost, the first sermon that was reported in the book of Acts. Later, Peter had the opportunity to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, starting with Cornelius. Then Peter wrote some of the most powerful words found in our New Testament, First and Second Peter. And here, history says that Peter was crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Paul, persecuted Christians, was a blasphemer. In Second Timothy four verses six to eight, Paul says. For I am ready, being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And tradition tells us that Paul died a, a martyr's death, for his faith being beheaded in Rome. So you and me, what is our list of sins? Are they any different than what we looked at in, in Moses, Jacob, David, Peter, Paul? Yet they were forgiven of their sins. So why shouldn't we be thinking that we should be forgiven of ours? First John 1 and verse 9, John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all right, unrighteousness. John makes it quite clear, as long as we acknowledge our sins, our sins will be forgiven. John goes on to say that, our, that we are also cleansed from all, all unrighteousness. And earlier in verse 7, John says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all sin. If I understand that correctly, the only way we are not forgiven our sin, of our sins, if we continue to sin, and fail to try to do better. In 1 John 2 and verse 1, John also says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
Here, John reminds us that Jesus is our advocate or the one who argues in our favor. Can you think of anyone else that you would rather have argue on your behalf than Jesus? Overcoming guilt. You know, before you and I responded to the gospel and became a Christian, we knew that we were lost in our sins. In Romans 3, 23, the Bible says that for the wages of, or for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. And then he goes on to say, but and he talks about Jesus and Jesus ultimately giving his life on the cross for our sins. That's the good news. That's what gives us that hope that we have in Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, there are a few few things that, that the Bible tells us that we need to do to have that guilt of our sins removed so that we can be in a right relationship with him. First thing is, of course, we have to hear the word. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 15, Paul says, And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So the, the ones that stand before us and give our lessons are those that preach that good news that we hear. We're also to believe in, in what we hear. In Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, Now after John, speaking of John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Then we're also to repent of our sins. In Mark 4 and verse 17, the Bible says, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're also to confess and acknowledge Christ. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And then we're immersed or baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. In Acts 22, 16, Paul says, or Luke says, And now, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Well, after that, then is the hardest part of our life, is remaining faithful to God. There's so many verses that talk about that. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And then James in one, chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Are we overcoming the guilt that's in our lives? Hopefully, we know that if we've repented of, the, of those things, God has forgiven us. We shouldn't dwell into the things that we did in the past. It might be good to be mindful of them from time to time so that we don't make the same mistakes again, but God's forgiven us, and so we should forgive ourselves too. If you have a reason to come forward this morning and respond to God's invitation, we invite you to do so now as we stand and sing.